Kamakawa. We're in a terrible place. So it became sort of um, so, so difficult. And he had a little pocket Quran. And a short while later, the guy comes back and takes that. And no. That told me that he's not going home. Asad, you're originally from Pakistan, or at least your, your family? Yes, I was born in Pakistan and we moved to England in the 60s. Wow. Do you, obviously, through your, your work, you've spent a lot of time in the, in the Middle East. Do you, do you get to go to Pakistan often? Well, yes, um, I did. Um, I moved to Pakistan to be closer to my parents. So I was doing a lot of, would you believe I was getting more work there from the West than I do here in the sense that I was there on the ground with experience and, um, you know, things like Panorama, for example, you know, it's something that my father used to say, watch Panorama, it's good for you. And who would think that one guy would direct one? And one of the, you know, I guess one of the best ones. So, uh, you know, those things kind of came to me because I made connections, had a lot of access. Um, and so, you know, it, it was sort of handy in that sense that I could open doors for people through my connections in the army, which just was amazing. Have you been in the army yourself? Is that? No, 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 no. It's not something I would do. No. I don't blame you. <laughs> no. I, no. I had the... Um... I had the wonderful experience of driving through your country on, on the way to India. Really? Okay. And then driving back through on, on, on the way home. I drove, a, I drove a bus to India once from, from Norway. Oh, how exciting. We were volunteer workers. We were just writing articles about people that live in um, different communities i suppose and 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 as you we got more towards india in impoverished communities but the hospital hospitality we experienced in pakistan was incredible um and the 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 scenery the landscape is just amazing and it's also incredibly hot Yes, it is. But if you got to go to the northern areas, Hunza, Gilgit, Skardu, that's just amazing. Yes. It, am I right in thinking, Asad, as far as um, rebel action goes, it, it gets more dangerous in, in, in the north, is it? No, no. Uh, when we talk about the north, we're talking about a different, uh, it's like where the Hindu Kush, Karakorams and uh, Himalayas meet. Whereas when we talk about, I think people get mistaken because there's South Waziristan and North Waziristan in the tribal areas. And people, when we talk about Northern areas, I think they tend to associate uh, with North Zeriska, whereas in fact the northern areas uh, are, uh, you know, like paradise. I mean, it is said that Pakistan is the second most beautiful in the world, I mean, beautiful country in the world after Switzerland, whereas I think, having been everywhere in Pakistan, because I made a film for the tourism board, uh, spectacular. Because everything is on a grand scale, the mountains, whereas uh, in Switzerland, they're much, you know, like smaller, 
even the sister peaks in Pakistan don't have a name. Whereas uh, we go for the day there for just f- for, to go off to Murray, which I'm sure you've heard of, which is twice the height of Ben Nevis. Wow. Just for the day, you just go there. Yes, tre- trekking is popular in that part of the world. Yes. And I also think they, they grow a lot of this stuff, don't they, up there? Uh, not as much anymore. It's more in Afghanistan. And in fact, it's with the full blessing of the US and CIA, you know. Are we talking about the opium now or, or the weed? Opium. Oh, the weed grows wild. Nobody grows it. It's, you can smell it around this time of year. You could go out and you smell it. Mm. And, of course, I have no use for it. Yes, it's so interesting that you say... Um, that's a very honest statement. I mean, everybody... Well, maybe they don't know, but the, the CIA control the, the drug trade the, the world over. Yes. I think people think the CIA is some sort of, you know, they protect people. <laughs> yeah. um, but the more we're, the more we're learning about the world, it seems all the people you're told are the good guys, they're actually the bad guys, and the people you're told are the bad guys are 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 actually the uh, the better ones. Yes. Yes. So how did you start working for a, or as a journalist? Well, I think I fell into it because really um, my interest lies in feature films, drama. And, of course, I got as far as an assistant director. And in fact, I directed some second unit work on some films because, you know, sometimes the budget is so low that we don't have a second unit director and we just say, oh, you will do <laughs> so. I was given a storyboard and I went out and shot, shot stuff. But um, it's sometimes some projects just fall into your lap and you know if you don't do it, somebody else will. And I met this guy who wanted to, you know, he was a martial arts specialist and he wanted to make Bruce Lee kind of film. And I said, I'm not interested in those. It's all about fighting sort, you know. But there was another chap next to him who, you know, sitting next to him, and I said, well, so what do you do? He said, well, I uh, track down girls who've run away from home, or boys for that matter, uh, because they've been pressured into marrying somebody they don't want to. And uh, I track them down because the police won't do it because they're a very keen. I said, oh, wow, what a great idea. So I, as he was leaving, I was outside on the pavement, quickly jotting down the notes for a, a documentary, and which I sent to a friend of mine, and he managed to raise the money within the week. And uh, so I followed him all over England. And um, when the film came out, it was titled The Bounty Hunter. And um, there was a lot of uh, controversial, you know, like things. Parliament discussed it. Um, there was a South Hall Black Sisters. They went out on a, 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 you know, demonstrating. So it was all kind of things, but I fell into that because I, um, you know, like when you said directing, so you think, okay, I'll do even this small job just so that I can sort of tell the story myself. So um, it kind of came to me, then me go after it, as it were. Mm. And your the story of your kidnapping is just, it's just beyond horrific. It, it yes. must, must have been one of the most, well, the, the most frightening experience, I think, that a human being can be put through. Yes, I think uh, especially when for no reason you're lifted out of your environment that you're used to and put into something which is totally against your system. Mm-hmm. And to adjust to that is not easy or you know you have to kind of be very strong in mentally uh, to have the stamina to take everything that comes towards you because if you don't you're, you're gonna die yeah we'll come on to that because i'm interested to learn what what uh, mental techniques you you had to employ to 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 keep sane mm-hmm. but you were so you were in north 
Waziristan. Yes, yes. You're making a documentary. Yes. Is this the Diffusing Bombs documentary? No, no, no. Diffusing Human Bombs was uh, much more controlled in the sense that uh, I started work on Diffusing Human Bombs. And the idea of that story was to film it over a long period of time. It was about the uh, rehabilitation of boys who had been trained to uh, carry out suicide bombing. Mm -hmm. However, for some reason they didn't and were caught by the army and they thought these guys are too young to jail. So uh, we should actually rehabilitate them into jobs that they might do, like being an electrician, plumber, or you know, those kind of trades. So um, I was, uh, and the, the idea was that, you know, you've got to see them actually progress. And I started filming sometime in I think, December of uh, 2009 and you know, follow them around. And then in March, of course, I was taken hostage. So that film stopped there. And one of my biggest worries was, I hope they don't employ someone else to finish the film because I want to do it. And um, of course, that's me thinking that I'll be released any day once they find out who I really am. Because all the time I thought I was captured by ISI. You see, the Pakistan Security Agency. Yes, I, that's Pakistan's security services. Yes, right? Inter services, um, I think inter services intelligence or something. Yes, they um, had a they had a big part to play in the Afghanistan wars, haven't they? Yes, yes, um, they're recruited they, to be the best. They worked closely with the Americans against the Russians, so that the CIA supporting the, the, the Mujahideen against the Russians. Yes. Yeah. OK. And so you were up there on a, making a separate film. Yes. And what it was, it wasn't through the army. It was just totally separate. Therefore, uh, I didn't have any army um, protection. I knew I was going out in dangerous territory. And it would have been a scoop had we got it. But uh, it was the story is incredibly, um, you know, very complex in the way it's been woven. Uh, Khalid Khwaja, who is like, like the go-to person or was the go-to person in Pakistan for anybody who wanted to shoot news. In fact, Daniel Pearl met him to get access to uh, this guy called Peer Mersha Gilani in Lahore. And Khalid Khwaja said, go back, you're not going to have access, he doesn't give interviews. But he persisted and uh, somehow he was entrapped in a restaurant in uh, Karachi. In fact, I uh, worked on the film, The Journalist and the Jihadi, the story of Daniel Pearl, and we reenacted all those scenes where he was picked up and then taken to the outs you know, outskirts of Karachi. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and Khalid Khwaja was a major player. He was the first to know of Daniel Pearl's arrival in Pakistan, talked to him. And the first person to be told that he's now being killed. So everybody used to go to him for access to places. And, but he was known to me, especially my brother, because uh, they had dealings, because my brother's a lawyer up there. And so I asked him, you know, I said, look, this is where we want to go. Can you give us access? And, um, he was all willing, yes, let's do it. But um, unbeknown to me, he had his own agenda. So um, when we set off, I mean, it was horrible because I used to get these premonitions all the time. Something's bad is going to happen. But I suppose, you know, you just think, oh, it's to be taught, you know, just blow them off. However, 
you know, when I was leaving, I was married at the time, and I said to my wife, if I don't come back, please forgive me. And um, my mother and father standing in the drive, they don't want me to go. And I didn't want to go. But uh, so we left and we, uh, en route, certain things were happening which I was most uncomfortable about. And then we got a text message. I said to Khalid Khawaja, please leave your phones at home because you might be trapped. I just, so he did. So here we are, out quite far, far away from home, and we get a text saying, don't go, journalist's life in danger. And um, I, sh I showed him, you know, it came to my, his son, it had gone to his phone, and his son had forwarded it to me. And uh, I said, look, this is the case. And he said, uh, okay, let's go back. And as we're heading back, it was like Islamabad to the right and a town called Kohat to the left. It was a fork in the road. Just arriving there, he said, look, I can make some foreign calls and pull some strings and we can go back. I said, no, 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 we've got to go home. I've told everybody we, we, we aborted the mission and we have to go home. Colonel Imam, who was with us, and, you know, like I hadn't asked him to come and he was with us. And he said, we've been exposed, we should go home. But uh, Khalid Khwaja wouldn't listen. And I kind of capitulated because he was a good friend of my brother's. And I knew that if I made a song and dance about not going, he would complain to him. So out of respect for my brother, I thought, well, I'll just keep quiet. It's four days and we're done. And um, so the night we stayed at a politician's house that he knew, which we later believe that he had something to do with it, but I don't know, there's no proof. And so um, the next morning we go back to this, uh, the last kind of t t town in Pakistan, it's called Bannu. And there, from there onwards, you into the tribal areas and not really under control of Pakistan. You see, yeah. And there, your mobile phones don't work. You have um, you're at the mercy of the locals, really. You know, if they like you, great. If they don't, they're not interested in any excuses. You know, because they think everybody from outside is an enemy of the Americans. Uh, is an enemy of Pakistan because they're on the side of the Americans. In fact, my brother was telling me a story. They found a business card of an American guy in this, a local's um, possession. They killed him for being an American spy. Yeah, life can be very cheap in these parts of the world. Yes. People will take 50 rupees to kill someone. Because there's no law. They know that they, nobody's going to come after them. Yeah, we should point out life is just as cheap in Britain it's 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 just it's hidden hidden under the carpet but yeah. where we're talking about it's 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 open um yeah. which is probably in a way better because at least you know who you're dealing with and, and, and where you are um yeah. so i'm just going to clarify for our friends at home so you're with your um your driver Rus rustam khan no, no, he actually, I don't know why he's been reported as my driver. He's my assistant to pick, you know, like to lift heavy things. He's a strong guy. Okay. But he couldn't drive. We, we, <laughs> we hired a car that took us as far as Bungo. Then from there, we got into a standard minibus and uh, they dropped us off. Uh, at another place, but you see, for, and in Bung, because the original guide wasn't answering the phone, uh, it didn't make sense that somebody who Khalid Khwaja knew would uh, not answer the phone. Then so all of a sudden, this young guy appeared out of nowhere, funnily enough. His name was Saddam, and uh, he's our guide. I said, oh, okay, for me. And so we went to a place called I think it was called Mir Ali in, in the minibus. 
And, and on the journey in the minibus, it's funny that he stopped somewhere, I went into a house, maybe made a phone call, I don't know. Probably telling some people that we're on our way. Mm. So we got off and uh, because the route of the minibus was in a dire different direction and we were going like this way. And this guide said, okay, I'll go and hire a car. So I walked back down the hill to get a car. And where we're standing, a car, another car comes out of the bushes, windows black, everything black. Uh, and they want just a small area for the rear view wind, uh, mirror for them to see. Black. And these, the guy's looking at us and I noticed him. I don't think anybody in my team noticed. And I saw them and I thought, hmm, that's funny. They seem to be looking at us. Then they drove on the road and then back into the bushes again and vanished. Hmm. And do we think this is is Taliban or 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 who who, who do we think well, this could be? We believe it was a faction of two groups of the Taliban. One was, I think, Lashkar -e Janguri, and one, there was another one. They were actually Taliban people who made this little group, which they called Asian Tigers. And I believe they were just there for this mission because we've not heard of them since. We didn't hear of them before. So this was an operation, which uh, well, I'll reveal later why I think it, it was an operation. Um, so as they disappeared into the bushes, and again, I thought, this doesn't look good. And consequently, I, uh, I mean, I, nobody else noticed again. I had seen that all these things were coming to me, these sort of premonitions or, um, the um, signs of danger, something not quite right. And um, when Saddam brought the car, I mean, it was all, we were all very tightly packed in it. And I thought at this point I should start an interview with Khalid Khawaja while we're driving so we can show that the countryside around us and that we're in the wilderness. And in fact, that place had been bombed for 100 years. Was it? started off by the British and uh, was continuing with the drones and everything else. So it was had a long history of war. And so I thought, you know, this would be a good place for him to start telling me about this place and how it's going on. And because, and I had, I was sitting in the front seat looking back at him. So I had no idea what's going on behind me. And all of a sudden gunshots and rather than put his foot down, so then just stopped the car. And there we see these guys. Firstly, they were pretending to fix, be broken down and fixing a car, but they all had hoods on, you see. And uh, they came to my car and said, get out. I, the door wouldn't work. I said, come get out. And I'm confused as to what is going on. Why has this happened? Is this some kind of a joke? And the original driver of the hire car ran and they shot him. And so I left him there. And then we, uh, you know, they asked me, to, I got out of the car, left my equipment on the seat. Of course, we, I was worried about that because these are my tools of my trade and I need them. And I saw them uh, with Khalid Khwaja. He's kneeling down and they kind of hit him. And then Colonel Imam said, look, I'm your friend, you know, because he was like the father of the Mujahideen, which later became the Taliban, as it were. And they hit him too. I thought, oh, this sounds bad. And in fact, a little bit earlier, um, Colonel Imam says, I should have brought my pistol. And Khalid Khwaja said, well, if we get, somebody asks, we're on missionary work and these guys are filming us. And I thought, my God, they talk about this now. Now that we're in no man's land, what on earth is going on? You see? And um, because from that moment on, I thought, this is going to be a roller coaster ride for me. And, um, you know, they put a, you know, because I was an outsider, so I felt more in danger, as it were. And it's like they say, you know, British, no, American and Israeli passports are the most dangerous to have in the world. 
I was there having a British passport, as it was. So I was, I felt worried that this is not going to be good. So they, what they did was they handcuffed us very tightly in the back like this, very, very tight. Still have a scar to show that I cut myself. And I had no idea that when you struggle with the handcuffs, they actually get tighter. I had no idea. And um, Rustam, who is much stronger than me, I mean, you know, he's, uh, he used to pull one of those wooden, very heavy wooden carts laden with lots of stuff. And, you know, he was a strong man. He started to cry because the, the um, handcuffs were so tight. So they squeezed us in this car. Me and Rustam together in the back seat, and then Saddam on my left, and this another one of these captors to his uh, right. So they, 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 there was no way we could escape from the car. And then, as soon as they got in the car, they were on the radio to the other people of what's going on. So they, were, they had good communication. And Saddam is kind of pretending to cry. Well, this isn't right, he's pretending. And you have to still make us believe that he's a victim. I was suspect about that. Colonel Imam, he put into the uh, back. So he, you know, it was very uncomfortable for him. And, um, you know, these guys, the ones, there's one or two that didn't have their mask on, or hood, shall I say. And they looked very young. I mean, when I say young, I mean like late teens or early twenties. And, um, so we seem to be driving forever and ever. And um, they, get, they got a puncture somewhere and had to stop forever and get a spare tire. And all this time, they're not allowed to leave the car. We jack it up and we're still sitting in the car. And it's getting hot. And then once we take off again, I heard, you know, certain things you hear on the way I heard, a horse galloping. And they're talking amongst themselves and saying, these, these are the horses that the Taliban use for uh, training. And then a little while later, they said, this is the way to Khost, spelled K-H-O-O-S-T, which is the border town in Afghanistan. And um, so I'm thinking they're taking me into Afghanistan. You see? So, um, I mean, there's obviously a lot of deductions I made based on the way they, they never told me who they were. I, so I made the assumption, or it was kind of, how can I say, uh, encouraged, you know, because this, when we got to this place at night, in the, you know, like it was in, I could feel that they, because I mean, they blindfolded me. I could feel that the streets were very tight and uh, so certain smells, like somebody's cooking, you could go and waft. So I thought we're kind of in an area where there's people living. And um, so they took us out uh, into a house, which was like a mud hut house. And the funny thing is that uh, and we were obviously still uh, blindfolded, but you can smell it's a mud house, mud, mud hut house. And they asked us to identify ourselves. And then somebody came close to me and cocked his gun. And I thought, oh my God, that's my turn. And, um, you know, like, uh, then he just laughed. You know, and then they accused of being Indian spies, working for at that time. Uh, the Indian prime minister was uh, was it uh, Singh? You know, for for, for the Indians anyway. Mm. And uh, I said, no, no, we're not doing anything for anybody. We're just making a film. And that led to, well, then you know they emptied my pockets, everything. I thought, oh no, yeah, they took my watch, which was given to me by my wife at the time. They put everything except 
I said, you know, and they started to look through my pockets and they came across my, uh, what they call it, lip balm. I said, no, please, can I keep that? You know, I, I need that. Don't be, don't uh, take this. So they, they allowed me to have that. So then they said, we're going to take your blindfold off and do not make any sudden moves. I said, no problem. And um, we saw, then I started, I looked and uh, they were in the room. It's as if, you know, it was decorated. And one part on the wall, they had a huge poster of Colgate toothpaste, except it was, I think it was the, the card that would be cut into individual cartons for the toothpaste, mm. but they have a huge printout of it. And that to them was a decoration, plus some other things. I think, so I guess maybe a wedding is taking place here, you see? And um, it, it, it just was a horrible place. And then they said, you know, because we'd be we were thirsty, we were hungry, and uh, they brought some food. And it was, uh, I said, I don't eat meat. And then they brought some water. And it's like a chalice type of thing, you know. And it tasted or smelled of petrol. I thought, that's not good. So then they thought, okay, this guy's clearly not eating. So they brought me a carton of milk and some biscuits, which I shared with Khalid Khwaja. And I thought, this is just not going to be good for me. And then they took everybody out. Curly mom was handcuffed and shackled and led out of the door. Which uh, kind of, you know, really worried me. Because I felt, I felt that he, um, if they do that to him, what chance have I got? And then they led everybody out one by one. And uh, Rustam was thrown into a hole in the ground. And he saw a snake. So she started to shout and boil, and then I heard some gunfire, bang, bang. And I thought, oh my God, they've killed Tusko. And uh, it was only in the morning I found out about the snake and that, and they shot the snake. And Tusko was okay, but he said he had a terrible night. I said, so did I. Because when I looked up in the ceiling, there was these geckos. I hate any creepy crawlers and anything like that. I'm very much OCD. And I thought, if they fell, fell on me, I will panic big time. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm literally afraid of, afraid of them. And I don't mind admitting to that. You know, all these kind of things I just don't go for. So um, I and this new guy came in and he said, my name is Christian Lal, which is an Indian name. And I work for the Indian Embassy and any stragglers we find here, we return them to their embassies so they can be repatriated. So, okay, so there's some officialdom here, which led me to believe that maybe I have been mistaken as a terrorist and I've been taken by ISI. So I just have to prove to them who I am and that's it. So the next day I'm interrogated and accused of being a spy. And I said, I'm not, I'm not a spy. I mean, I, then I started saying all the wrong things. Said, Look, I'm a very good friend of the Pakistan army. I know this person, I know that person. You can go and check me out from them. And all these are the things that they don't want to hear. Oh, and they don't tell me who they are, you see. And all the time I'm thinking, okay, so they'll, a few days time they'll have checked me and I'll be able to go home. And uh, so I waited, you know, I mean, I still denied myself any of their food. I said, they're dirty people, I don't eat their food. So they were giving me a garlic of milk and biscuits. And that's what I lived on for the first month, thinking that when I go home, I'll have my mum's cooking. You know, I, because I just can't eat this stuff that they make. They're not really clean. And um, 
all that's going on and I could hear others being interrogated. I, then I realized that we're all in the same compound and I kind of visualized how it is. And I think it was like a L shape, you see, mm -hmm. because the sound I could hear was from my right. So I thought, well, maybe in the next room, they've got Khalid Khwaja and maybe Khan Imam further down, but they separate you so that you can't have the same story. You see, that's the trick. So let me say first, that all of these guys were trained to take hostages. They weren't just anybody. They knew exactly what to do because they were trained. And uh, so, you know, like Krishna Lal again, used to be very much against Khalid Khwaja, you see. And also they were, they hated Khalid Imam. And I just couldn't work out what the problem was. So Rustam actually got caught up in something where he was an innocent party. And he was, of course, he understood their language. He uh, was from their kind of tribe, but lived in the city. And so they, they left him alone in the sense that if, you know, if one person was beaten, then they'd beat us all and he'd be in on it. He'd be beaten too. But on the whole, they kind of uh, were easier on him. And I said, well, you know, he's got nothing to do with it. Why don't you let him go? And they said, no, we don't do that. Okay, I, and so what um, I realized was that uh, it's going to, you know, like for me, I think it was the most difficult for me because I haven't spent that much time in Pakistan. I didn't grow, I didn't grow up there. So all the rudimentary things I had to put up with were very difficult for me. For example, uh, mosquitoes. I mean, they, they gave me a little, like a cot kind of thing on the floor with a net. And uh, I find some creepy crawlers inside in the home. I panic. I look at the pillow and it's almost black. And I thought, how can I live here? And um, it was just, my biggest worry was my mom. She'll be worried, and I always call her wherever I am, all the time. And if I don't call home, there's going to be a, she's going to be worried. So, so the next morning, I said to them, look, I, we need my mother to know that I, I, I'm with you, so she doesn't worry. And you know, the response was, what do you think? Don't we have mothers? I don't know. So I see. And so I, I designed myself to the fact that for a while, certainly, my family would assume that we don't have mobile phone contact, therefore, I can't contact them. And uh, then they took me for an uh, you know, interrogation and asking me where you're from, what you've done. I told them the truth, absolute truth. I'm a filmmaker, I was here to do this. How do you know Khalid Khwaja? How do you know Colonel Imam? And I said, I've never met Colonel Imam before. This was the first time and I didn't even know that he was coming with us. So uh, when the interrogation was over, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, simple questions. And the first like thing was accusing me of a spy. And I said, no, I'm not a spy. What happened then was they shifted me to another room which was supposed to be my own. And it was kind of frightened with a mud hut again, with a little alcove in the side at the toilet. I said, I'm not using this. <laughs> you know, most people laugh when I say this, but it's a, look, you're in a situation which is beyond anybody's imagination. And you're still trying to make a choice of, I don't want to do this, you know. So, and I said, I'm not going to use this. I don't care what you say. And uh, they said, okay. And then they brought me, uh, you know, all those kind of gallons of, uh, uh, you know, engine oil, 
cut. Yeah. Big beans. It's okay. And uh, when I used to say to them, can you now take this out? They would, to, to just to teach me a lesson, they would take the time. So I had to live with uh, what I would call land, L-A-N-T, stale P. <laughs> yeah. And uh, to go out uh, for other things, you know, they used to leave me out. I think in that place, I had washed myself once, but it was so difficult and frightening to go into this alcove to bed because it was so, I'm very claustrophobic. And um, so to pass my time in this little room, I come with all the nails that had been knocked into the wall. Then it had a kind of attached roof and I used to count all the logs going this way, that way, everything like that. And so then I would count all the little things on the floor to keep my mind busy. And then if I couldn't sleep, I used to think, okay, let me see how many US states I can name. You see? And then I said, okay, how many countries in the world? And try to start naming them till I kind of fell asleep. And the next day I would do the same thing again. And also the other thing I used to do was, because I almost, it was like my days of, had become nights, nights had become days as it were. So I used to hold a trial every night in which there was Musharraf, Bush, Condoleezza Rice, and I was the judge. And every night I would try them, punish them, and start again the following day. You see? And, uh, and nothing but in counting states and uh, countries and capitals and things like that to keep my mind busy. And then all the different kind of foods I could think of, flowers. I had to keep my mind busy, you see. So it was important for me to do that for my own sanity, I felt. And did I started you, um, to... Did you do Cheney and Rumsfeld while, while you were at it? So you said that? Did you try in your court Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld? No, I didn't actually because I thought they were small fish compared to you know the guy who was given the orders and the guy in Pakistan who associated with them to fight uh, in the war on terror. And um, that face of Congolese Rice, she's so, oh, I mean, just kind of a strict headmistress type of woman. And I disliked her. And some of the, in fact, I saw Bush and her when I was working for the government when they came to Pakistan and I looked at her and thought, you're an awful woman. And of course, you know, this thing about we rule the world. In fact, I often said to people, America's left to be the only superpower in the world because Pakistan and Afghanistan helped them. If it wasn't for those countries, they wouldn't be. Mm. Or, or in the earlier version of the same story, we were in Koita. And from there, we were smuggling to Afghanistan at night to interview a, a, a Taliban leader. And one of the questions was, so what do you think of America as the only superpower in the world? He said, what superpower? America is not a superpower. God is a superpower. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, this, this is a proper Taliban commander and very down to earth, he said, look, we don't want to kill anybody. We just want them to leave our land, leave us alone. You know? Sad, can you, can you continue your story? I shouldn't have interrupted you. It, it's just fascinating. So you're counting, you're passing the time by counting things. How, how did you deal with the fear? Oh, well, it was difficult. I mean, the fear was, Kind of because it was, you didn't know what's going to happen next. So I said, look, do you have anything I can read? And they brought me a book, which was very interesting, in fact. Um, it was all about some stories of religion. And uh, so I started reading this very thick book and some great stories in it, because there was one of um, the Prophet Muhammad before he had become a prophet. 
and because he got profited at the age of 40. So here he is going with his uh, colleague Abu Bakr and I think they travel to Syria and he, he sat on the way he sat down under a tree and his colleague went to a local house to get some water for him. And this friar opens the door and uh, says, who's that man sitting under the tree? And uh, he said, it's Muhammad. Uh, and he said, well, that man would be a prophet one day because the last person to sit under this tree was Jesus. You see? So there were such fascinating stories in this book. So one night I'm reading a book and I hear, you, you know, like when you get punched in reality, the sounds are very different to what they show in the film. In the film, they wear gloves, boxing gloves, and, and they get a carcass of, you know, cow or something, and they put it on a table and they punch, and they record those sounds as punches to people, which of course is not the case. So these are very dull, thud, thud, thud. outside my room, and then, Two fire uh, gunfights, quick succession, two, two. I thought, oh my God. And then Krishna rushes into my room, like with eyes sort of almost to pop from his eye sockets. And he looked at me and said, Do you want, you want to see some real human blood? And at that time, the book I was reading just fell out of my hands. <laughs> you know, I said, no, 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 I don't want to see any. <laughs> it was just something that we can't relate to in everyday life. You know, these things, these atrocities, you just don't, you read about them, but you don't really think you're going to be close to them. And, uh, you know, it was very, very difficult. I said, my goodness me, life has just been taken right outside me, like four or five feet away from me. And uh, how, how awful is that? And of course, that made me think, well, a time may come when they, they, they may do, do the same to me, you see. So, um, you know, like a few days later, a knock on my door and um, all these people came and they um, shuffled to my bag and found my, because um, by now I had a beer, they found my uh, razor and said, sit on this chair. I mean, okay, sit on the chair, but I have no idea what they're going to do. And then they started to shave my beard. And I felt awful. Because it's not something I would, you know, it's like, almost like being raped. Because they're doing this without my consent. And I could have done it myself. They said, look, we need you to do this. So having done that, what they did was to hang a um, dirty kind of sheet in the background to film me, um, my first video appeal. So having done that, they sit me down and this terrible, you know, like these big guys coming. One is, I was, you know, like wearing like a cloth, uh, like a robe that's made out of hessian. And there you go hoods on, I can't see who they are. And so one of the, the leader walks in and his name was Sabir Masood. And he looks at all those empty milk cartons and I said, he said, I see you like milk. And I said, there's nothing much here for me to eat. And then he said, well, our elders have given you the death sentence for being a spy. And of course, my mouth went dry. And um, I said, can I have a glass of water, please? And so they gave me one from their clay kind of container, which was in a blue plastic glass, if I can use the word. And it was quite dirty. But right now, I needed that drink. And it was so cold and nice. And I said, I need another. So they gave me another one. And... Um, that, you know, they said, look, we will um, take either his death or $10 million. I thought, nobody's going to pay the $10 million for me, I'm dead. 
you know, I mean, I have to accept that. And uh, so having put up this sheet, kind of was once a white sheet, now like more like grey. Um, and they said, like, right, we want you to make a statement on video and cry if you can. And, uh, I mean, it's not a place to cry right now for me. So I, uh, they, they told me what to say more or less. So I jotted it down and then read it because I said I can't memorize this. And that was the first, um, my first video, which was, uh, they'd used my tripod and put a little tiny camera, like a palm cord on it because the plate that screws under the camera was still screwed to my camera. And they didn't know that, that they need that plate to actually fit the camera onto the tripod. Mm. So I uh, did my best, still thinking that I'm with the ISI and they don't believe me. So it is up to me to prove to them that I'm straightforward, clean, I haven't done anything wrong and I want to just and clear my name and my team's name. So having you know, like made this statement, um, I'm still not sure who these people are. So I started to write, because what, see, Krishna used the word officer, our officers. So I thought, I thought okay, he, um, so there's be some uniform guys out there. And if they find out about me, then they let me go. You see, so I started to write to whoever uh, this officer would be, and I wrote in capitals because my writing is terrible and they wouldn't be able to read it. This is who I am, this is where I'm from, this is what I'm doing, and I have nothing to do with terrorism at all. And um, I don't know what they did with that. But I kept a diary of every, all the happenings, and one day Christian Lao found it tore it to pieces, slapped me around, and uh, I thought that was just terrible because my diary was just packed with information, which I probably wouldn't be able to recall in every detail that I had put down. So that was that. I thought, okay, let's just face up to it. From then on, I kind of lost track of time because I used to jot down in my diary, date, time, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, after a while, you just don't know because you've got no watch, no radio, nothing to tell you what's going on in the world. And even then they did a video of me with a newspaper on my chest as a proof of life uh, thing. And I wasn't allowed to look down to see the newspaper. So again, I had no idea what date it is or what they're doing to me. So I accepted that as okay, I'll do it. But what in this statement, this, they kind of um, said was, I mean, what it would have said was, you know, like, I'm a British citizen. But they said, English citizen. And I said it exactly the way they, they'd written it because so people outside know that's not me talking, it's their words. You see, because you, you can't hide many kind of words into your uh, statement because they know what I'm trying to do. And I mean, had I known Morse code, that would have been great to just blink and pass on a different kind of message, but I had no idea. And uh, so when, um, you know, this, I don't know where those messages were going and everything else, and on another occasion, these guys came into my room. They wore the hoods, and so I could see them. And, you know, they're talking to me and being very kind of down to earth and then saying, you'll see this as an adventure for yourself. And I thought, okay. And they said, well, when the time comes, you know, somebody will come and take you from here. Like they were kind of hinting at me. Because I said my brother was uh, like my next of kin. And they said, oh, he'll come here and take you. And I said, uh, Will you release me before the mango season? Because I love mangoes. You know, and I think that just went to one ear and out to the other. However, later on when they were serving mangoes, they said, I can't have any. You know, they give, 
them to the team with hardly any flesh on them. I said, I can't have any. And then the guy, Bruce, said, we're not eating them. I said, no, you better, because they'll beat you. And they said, well, why don't you have them? I said, well, they smell it on me, and then they'll beat me, so I don't want Let's just do, play the game the way they want us to. So that, um, you know, I just felt it's going on and on and on. And there seems to be no end to it. And um, I was running out of things to think about at night, as it were, you know, <laughs> like new things. You know, like even I counted all the relatives I had that were dead and gone, that were alive today. You know, you do everything, you know, going to the, back to school and naming all my teachers, and, you know, anything I could think of that I could probably do to keep my mind busy because I couldn't always read because uh, I couldn't concentrate. You know, like whatever I was reading wasn't going into my head. So it was very, very difficult to just, you know, sit there all day. And I had handcuffs with a chain going down to my ankles. So I was shackled, handcuffed. So sleeping was very difficult. And uh, I just one day sat there and said to myself, this is going to be long haul. And I use the word this term in my book that I had better downgrade some of my phobias because I need to survive this one. So having made that decision, I started to take their food. And um, because I said, you know, th 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 I can't allow myself to just go because I was already very weak. And um, you know, things that I enjoy very much, like I like like this in the summer, and I'm up to three, four showers a day, cold. That's something that I wasn't able to do, and I thought, you know, it's just so difficult. And uh, I never expected myself to be in a situation where I'd be, be like this. However, somehow word got, I think it was uh, my producer was telling me that the he had was still keeping in touch with the army. And one guy said, oh yeah, yeah, he's being well looked after. And I thought, where on earth did they get that from? And if I'm well looked after, clearly they would know where I am. Why wouldn't they try to get me out of there? So there was all kinds of news going around, which wasn't true because when I got out and I learned a lot more, and I thought not only was, you know, like uh, the army not doing anything, the police, well, they had no jurisdiction there. The media had been, you know, rather than you would think they would stick together with uh, other journalists to help protect them, they were the opposite. They were printing lots and lots of lies. And that gave a lot of people false hope, you see. And in that time, they were in touch with. Well, one day they came to me and said, uh, what's your email address? And I thought, oh, this is going to be bad. Uh, because I have information about my communication with, with the army and that, and I don't want to agree with you that. So they uh, took my uh, email address. And at the time, I, my password was numbers. And because of all that stress and everything, I'd forgotten my password. But uh, so he came back the next year, really mad at me. Give me your passport, he said, not password. And uh, it was Christian all again. You know, he, but sometimes he played the good guy or any you know, other good cop, bad cop. He would play that role with me. And um, he, so, so, I mean, but this is why I say that they, they were trained. So then I managed to remember the password and they, what they did was, and I only discovered this once I was released because one of the first things I wanted to do was to secure my email. And so I went into the sent mail and what they'd done is they'd forwarded uh, emails of mine to Hamid Mir, the, the guy who works at Geo News. And uh, he was made aware of what our purpose was out there. Because then there's a long telephone call 
between Usman Punjabi, one of the kidnappers, and Hamid Mir, that's recorded, in which Hamid Mir tends to show a lot of animosity towards Khalid Khwaja, and he has been accused of orchestrating his murder, which he denies by saying, this is synthesized voice, it's somebody else, it's not me, which I don't believe because the proof is he was in touch with them. He's got the, uh, my emails. And these are before Khalid Khwaja's murder. You see? And uh, thankfully, the case has restarted in Pakistan recently. So the story has come back to life. And this time, they think that Hamid Mir will uh, be prosecuted and done for. I hope he is because he's not a good journalist and he does play dirty. And uh, I was threatened kind of by one of his colleagues uh, by, that if I print anything in the newspaper, uh, in the, my book, he will uh, sue me. So, but if with a solid proof like an email, which uh, shows that my email has been sent to him, and which will be in the book, a picture of that will be in the book, that can't lie. I mean, that's a fact. And whether he was guilty or not, the email is there, you see. So, um, I hope it helps to win the case because uh, Khalid Fadi's wife wouldn't testify in court. She said God will take, God will avenge her. And that's why the case didn't go any further. But this time, I'm told the I side are involved in prosecuting him and uh, taking care of him. So his other brother has been also a journalist has been arrested for or some of his old cases were have been uh, revived. I think want to for him to uh, fight them. So um, that was that was like so, uh, I was, I, this, I was still in the first place uh, where I was uh, in that mud hut. And one night I heard so many, what we call RPGs or people metal, grenades, bullets flying. It was, and I was looking up. Any minute now, I thought my roof would cave in. There was so much going on. And they, the next day they moved us. So the next day they took me out of my room blindfolded and stood me in the middle of there. What I kind of worked out would be four coke. And um, I'm standing there, standing there, and I think maybe they're going to shoot me. And, you know, I, I can hear people moving around me, but uh, I don't know what's going on. Then so all of a sudden, you know those uh, burkas that you see a lot of Afghani women wear? Yes. They came and dropped one of those on my head. And it seemed like it was a small one, like it's for a young girl. Like it smelled cheap for perfume on that. And so here I am, stood in the middle of nowhere with this garment on that, uh, which John Simpson said he wore, and he felt invisible in it when he was in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And so with that, they, um, after a while, led me out to uh, the vehicle. And we all packed in tightly and they start to drive and I <laughs> hear some splashes so it had rained and then they stopped somewhere and said, you know, we need to do this uh, sort of quickly because people are watching us. And um, I thought, okay, so another clue fell into my head that if they were who this, I thought they are, they wouldn't have any reason to hide. Pause. Pause. Pause it. Yeah. And hear my mama. So while I'm in this mud hut, one day, Kishinal comes in and says, some people are going to come and see you and you better tell the truth. So he blindfolded me and put me in a corner and you know, when you sit there, the wall is cold. It's just mud hut, very thick wall. And then in came these people and I could see some stuff being set up 
So I'm assuming it was a camera again, a tripod, or other stuff. And I hear several voices which I hadn't heard before. So they started to interview me. And um, there's one voice that I felt was not from Pakistan, possibly India. You know, it just didn't sound local. And so they started asking me a question. They wanted to know about uh, the, you know, like, and again, I'm sitting here checking me out. Where is the office of the ISI in Islamabad? And I, I said, I can't, let me, I, I can't think exactly of the address, but I know I can picture it. And they said, do you like to have a computer to, to see? I said, no. Um, then I remembered where it was and I said, it's there. And um, that, then I said, look, I'm a filmmaker. I have nothing to do with spying and terrorism. And I said, like right now, I'm making a film on kids who were um, brainwashed to do you know, suicide bombing and their re rehabilitation. And uh, the whole idea is to make it positive, show positively that the army is doing something for people. And, um, and they said, well, do you think these people would, um, these kids could have a relapse? Um, you know, uh, and, and I said, well, they could, but, and, you know, like he, he's, they were trying to guide me to, I said, like, they said, you know, like the Pakistani army did in 1971, where they tied grenades to themselves and roll under tanks. And that's where it hit me. 1971. 1971 was the war between, uh, well, you know, the independence of East Pakistan to Bangladesh. And I thought every Pakistani knows it was 1965 when Indian tanks were entering Lahore, where people rolled under soldiers rolled under the tanks with bombs to blow up the bomb, uh, the tanks. And this everybody knows, and they don't. And that is when I realized. I'm in the wrong place, and the wrong place with the wrong people, and I'm in trouble. And it's like I, I just can't, I can't see the fear because I'm blindfolded, but I know now I'm in big, big, big trouble because uh, now I realize who I'm with. You see, they're not ISI because they would have known 1965. I think it's either 5th or 6th of September, which now they celebrate as, um, I think it's celebrated as Defence Day, you see. And, and um, I'm scared. I thought now I told them everything they need to know, like as the Mafia would say, I sang like a canary and now they're going to get me. So when the interview was over, Krishnan comes up to me and said, you have... Um, Done well. Now we're going to take you to the American compound where you can have a good time and watch satellite TV and all that kind of stuff. Okay. I don't know. Why don't can't I just go home? And he said, Well, no, we want you to have a good time. So when they drove me with that burqa on, they drive me to this place which is uh, brick built, and he's saying, You better, uh, there's wires, trip wires. And you better walk to, to you know step over them and that's what you know it's okay. We tried it when we got in, and in one room they put me into one room and get Khalid Khwaja into with me. And I hear a voice, finger on the lips. And that, oh my God. We're in a terrible place, so I'm just sitting there like this, blindfolded. And um, all of a sudden, I, I, I hear this kind of punch, you know, like when you punch in the back and there's a kind of a hollow kind of a sound. And it was Khalid Khwaja they punched. And so I said, What's that for? He said, A finger on the lips. And again, I thought, I can't recognize this voice, so. We're in big trouble here. And then um, 
when we are finally uh, the blindfold had taken off, I realized it was Krishna. You see, and all that time of, uh, trying to fight this, and then he said, "Look, we have a cellar downstairs. Where we have ice box. It's a cold room. If you mess around with us, we go down there without clothes." So now they told us something else, and the windows I saw had like metal sheets on them so you couldn't look out but they were like an oven you know because they, mm. they couldn't get any air coming in and out so um, it became sort of um, so so difficult because at night they wouldn't turn the lights off so you were you know like sleeping in this you couldn't really sleep properly with the lights on. And then they started to say, you know, like, well, Khalid Khwaja said to me, very quietly, don't trust anyone. And I was kind of mad at him. I thought, you'd give me the impression you knew everything, and that you had contacts. And uh, instead, I'm being, uh, so this, and because they said that they, there were microphones in the room, better not talk. So I, I said to be quiet, but uh, I wasn't happy with what had happened because, you know, uh, he'd been too confident. And uh, this is where he's brought us. And uh, I didn't even want to come. In the end, you see, we decided that's it, we're not going. And so I was beginning to read that the text that was sent had obviously some truth in it and you know, lots of other things. So Khalid Khwaja was with me for two nights and we didn't say a word to one another for fear that there's these microphones in the room and they'll hear us. And if we do, then we'll be sent down to the cold room and uh, also, I, I was rather angry that, you know, because he brought me in this situation and all, the only thing I would do is shout and bother him and then they'll punish me. So I thought, if I keep it cool, just ride it through. And two days later, they led him out of the room, took him away. And uh, that's the last I saw of him. And I think it was on the... End of April, the last day of April, they executed him. And uh, it seems as if they took him to the, you know, had him shower, took him to for Friday prayers, after the prayers, took him by a little stream and shot him. And accused him of being an American agent. This is not true. And these um, are, can be in like, when you listen to that phone call of Hamid Mir, which is probably on YouTube, and uh, he talks about CIA. So they took it as, oh, well, he's an agent killer. I had no idea, they didn't tell us. They didn't tell me uh, anything about that. And, um, they just sort of, uh, you know, it was now me and Rustam were in the same room. Rustam was brought to my room. And Krishna opened a black case of what I would call torture equipment, like pliers and stuff. Um, and he actually got the pliers, he put them on his nail. I said, no, and then sort of jumped on him and uh, he just stood back and laughed and I thought how stupid to do that and then Rustam was blindfolded at this time and he, they're trying to do this to him and I, um, okay so I came back to reality and these people just playing mind games 
And there's another guy, which I said to you earlier, was sat next to Rustam in the car when they first picked us up. His name was Noman. And he, 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 he was, you know, like, uh, I later learned that he'd been in Guantanamo Bay. And um, he sort of uh, came into the room and emptied his gun out, you know, his bullets everywhere. And said, pick him, pick him up, which we did. And he said, there's one missing lesson. Have a look. Oh, you may have hidden it for this. You, 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 know, you, you got one of my bullets. And I said, you don't have it. You see? And uh, so that was an ordeal. Then I looked, started seeing on the floor, somebody had made a key out of a paper clip for the um, handcuffs. And I thought, clearly, we're not the first ones here. These guys have a habit of capturing people. So, just to stay on the right side of things, when Krishnan came in, I said, Look, I found this on the floor. Because if he found it, he might accuse me of making it to escape. Or if I hid it and they found it, same thing, and be, you know, you get beaten up big time. I mean, it's really, it's all about if you beat one person, you beat them all. And they enjoyed that. So, um, it became tougher for me because I was getting very tired of this repetitive style where I'm not, I don't have, uh, we don't have really uh, access to daylight and we have to survive in this room. Now I've got Rustam, but Rustam never went to school. He's not a guy you can talk to about much. You know, and he's, uh, he's just a strong guy, that's it. And, um, you know, like he was, and this is why he worked in, uh, a timber yard because he could pick up a whole log on his back and move it. He was a strong man. But um, he, and you know, I think he had 11 children, so I just try and remember his children's names as well, so that I, I you know, like uh, to keep my mind sharp rather than just let it go dormant. And because um, you know, before I, all this, uh, all these quiz shows I used to watch and my family used to say, oh, you must go on this, you must go on that. I said, no, I, this is for me. And knowing this industry is very exploitative. And when you're on a quiz show, they ask you, so what are you going to do with this money? So they're actually uh, trying to get your, your, you know, to exploit your greed, as it were. I said, I wouldn't do that, you know. So, so uh, but then you know, in, later on, that stress of being a captive. Uh, I, I don't remember, it. sometimes I can't answer the question right away. And I've always used to say, you've got to get the answer before the option come up, comes up. You know, all the options. If you can't, then it's, you've got one in four chance or one in three chance. It's, it's, you've got to get the answer before. And uh, so, I, I mean, I used to be very good, but not as much now. So, uh, you know, like I think my mind or brains kind of with the stress, PTSD, probably slowed down a little since. And uh, so, you know, Murustam and I were there in that room, and unbeknown to me, at the other end of the complex, they had Colonel Imam. They locked him up in the toilet. And he was a tall man. And the way that toilet is designed is that there's a little bit of a you know, step so he couldn't really stretch his legs out. And he had to live there for two weeks. And so they were more cruel to him than me because he had been on television shows as an analyst, as had Khalid Khwaja. And uh, so they, but they, their attitude towards them was very, very bad. And one day while we are, uh, now, they've let Khalid Hoya out of the room, and there's me and Rustam, and we can hear in the next room somebody being flogged big time. I mean, seriously 
flogged. And um, just because of the commotion, I just happened to ask Krishna what's going on. He said, this man, he's a very pious man, but he deals in drugs, etc. And, um, you know, why is he doing that? And I thought, well, why does this make them a law unto themselves? Who are they? So he said, we're everywhere. You know, we are everywhere, in every department. I, I don't know whether that was him boasting or it was a pack of eyes. Then, um, Sort of later, no more sound from that uh, guy being flogged. So the next day I said, well, what happened to him? He said, oh, he had a tooth in which there was some poison and he just bit on that guy, which I don't believe, of course. I believe they killed him. He must have been somebody else who got picked up and didn't like or whatever. And there were many stories like that. Oh, we've caught a Chinese woman and uh, she was working spying on us. And then they said there was a, an American soldier who, who joined them and uh, was a very nice guy. He decided to become Muslim and then he died in an attack. Again, there's no proof, so I don't know if there's any truth in that. Now, meanwhile, all this is happening inside. Outside was a totally different story. I mean, just enough, obviously, worry for me, and I was worried for my parents. But um, a guy read about me in the newspaper and approached my brother to say he could help. And this same man some time back had come to my brother's office and said, I need some money. He didn't say, give me a loan. He said, I need some money. Give me some money. So he gave him some money and he went away. And when he came back to offer help, my brother said, well, pray, because by now he'd found out they wanted $11 million, so $10 million for me. And he said, no, come with me, I'm going to take you somewhere, but you don't wear your suit, you wear your local gear, and uh, go in a cheap car. So he went to this friend, and uh, there was this guy, his name is Fazal Khalil Rahman, but we call him Mr. Z in the story, because everybody had to be anonymous. Because of story. we didn't know, so my brother didn't know who to trust. And so everybody, you know, would be coded. And like I was known as a package, you see, in that conversation. So um, this guy, Mr. Z, he went to see and he just listened and then said, forget about Khalid Khwaja and Colonel Imam. I can do nothing for them. Come back tomorrow for the rest. So the next day, so yeah, the brother's alive. And um, now Mr. Z lived in a huge compound where he, he had what we'd call a madrasa, a school of religion, people uh, sort of study. And he, he was in the Afghan war against the Russians. And he lived on grass for a long time killed his first man with his bare hands at the age of 18, a Russian soldier, because he had to save bullets, you see. So he had a history, he was a strong man, he was, and the CIA, the ISI knew about him, you see. And um, so he's telling my brother, look, uh, uh, you know, like, you have to separate me, you have to separate me from the rest of the team first. That, that way it might be easier to get me off the hook. But he said, don't have, hold your hopes up too high because the chance of him being brought back alive is less than 1%. You see? Mm -hmm. So the company that I was working for, which um, I'm not allowed to, I don't want to mention, but they went to see my brother and Due to his uh, lack of knowledge about this industry and how we operate, they, they tried to exploit him by saying, right, okay, they want $10 million. You need to delay, 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 sell the property, sell any family gold, any money you have in the bank. If not, get a loan to get him out. And my brother obviously thought, well, they're putting it all, everything on me. 
I didn't draw him. I didn't send him there. But so he thinking how to do this. And when my brother came to England, you know, because he'd said, right after his, my mom and dad was, came to England because for security. He, my brother said, everybody here except for his daughter and her husband. And um, they, you know, he used to come and see them regularly as well because he had to keep the hope alive for everybody. Or when he was in Pakistan, he would call them at nine o'clock our time here when it would be one o'clock in the morning for him there. So that he could tell mum some stories. Or if there was some progress, he'd tell her a little bit today and then a little bit tomorrow so that he could stretch it so that she would go to sleep and have some assurance, you know. And um, where were I? Where was I? Um, they, uh, so, so we, uh, when uh, all these trips back and forth, back and forth, Mr. Z lived in a huge compound. So it, uh, the company I was working for, they turned up in a stay, stay in a five star hotel, having a good time. And my brother told them that there's this other guy that she might be able to help. And they said, no, 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 don't trust anybody. You know, we've got to do it this way. And now my brother was caught in, in two camps, in between two camps, that the company employees have a hostage negotiator and um, they've written out a script for him, what to say, what not to say, and really buying more time. And the other guy is talking a different language. Now, if Mr. Z found out about the men from England, it, he would stop. So now the decision was who to go with. You see. So the, the way it was working out, and then the television company was known as the A Team. And they were scared. They said to my brother, we don't want you to come and see us on the days you meet Mr. Z. Because somebody might follow you. And then they thought, well, you know, they're more worried about themselves than the problem we're in. And that's not all. You know, if they've come here, then they, they've got to do something. And the one in the team just happens to say, well, you know, a Pakistani life is not worth as much as an English life. And um, my brother was, in, you know, he's a barrister and he, he, he handles big cases. He said, okay, if you're not out of this country by tomorrow, you will never leave. And we show you what a British life is worth. Because he was so disgusted by his statement. The next day, the guy had vanished. You know, I mean, that was just, it was at the wrong time. I mean, you could joke about it, these kind of things, maybe. I don't know, but not a good time to be saying stuff like this. So while he was in England, he also learned, because he met my producer, who didn't go, he backed out and, um, you know, like he had all kinds of reasons, but he was not well, you know, health-wise. So I... He said, my brother said, you know, this is what they're saying, raise X amount of money and this and that. He said, oh, I'm protected by insurance. I signed a form. And they didn't tell that to my brother. He had no idea. So now he has armed with some information that they don't think he knows about. And he's going to have to turn the table on them. You see, because they're just exploiting me and him now. And to get out of the situation, scot free, as it were, which I think they played very dirty. And uh, when 
he went back to see them and said, look, you know, this is what I'm told. But he has insurance and is protected by that. And you, if they want 10 million, uh, you've got to give them 10 million. Yeah, they said, but we're not allowed to negotiate with the uh, terrorists because that money will go back to attack other people. You know, so we're 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 in a tight situation. Mm. So then he said, well, so you are telling me to raise money to pay them, and that's okay. When he's your employee under your insurance, you know. And also, then he found out that sometimes journalists get some kind of a small GPS that he can be tracked. And why wasn't I given one of those? So during meeting with Mr. Z, uh, he said that he, you know, he sent word out all over the place, and Al Qaeda were willing to do an operation to free us. But they decided not to because they knew that they'd have split us all up. And um, that we might be caught in crossfire, which is actually what happened shortly after I was released to a aid worker called Linda, I think, Norgrove. It was an operation to rescue and she got caught in the crossfire and died. So they thought we won't do that because it's uh, less, you know, serious now. And uh, so when my brother realized that Mr. Z could pull many, many strings, he decided to jettison the team because their help was come, could be counterproductive because if he realized, because you see, he kept uh, telling me, because he was bugged every day with phone calls from the terrorists. Every day he said, look, my brother doesn't work for any company. He's doing this on his own accord to sell the film. All right? <laughs> but I'm telling them the truth. <laughs> so, so the thing is, so, uh, it was kind of, oh, um, I, of course, I had no idea he's telling them the truth. And, uh, not the, uh, you know, not the truth. He's not telling them the truth. And I am, and I am a stickler for that. I always, because him being a lawyer, he's trying to, and he knows the situation, like if the truth gets out, then they will not let me go because he, he was the one who told me the story about me. a local guy out there having a business card of an American and they killed him. So if they think I'm associated with a company uh, from the West. And actually also I was married to an American, American girl. So I had everything going against me as far as they were concerned. So to get out of that situation was going to be very, very tough. And... Uh, what um, where was it? What happened was then that uh, Mr. Z said to him, "When they phone, offer them this much money, and they see what happens." And when my brother it, it panicked, and the idea was to start low and work up, he just gave him the high figure that he could afford, and they said, "That's peanuts." And that's their word, peanuts. And it was it went on from there that uh, they were for more and more and more. And one reason was, oh, well, you hold a British passport, so you're going to reverse more. So I became a cash cow, whereas the other two main guys, Khalid Khwaja and Colonel Imam, for different things. Colonel Imam, they wanted, uh, I think, about 75 prisoners released, which wasn't going to happen. That was a death sentence already. Nobody would negotiate with them for that. And uh, with uh, Khalid Khwaja, they accused him of so many things that they didn't want anything from him, even though they said he was offering us so much money for his release, we didn't want him to go off. So uh, everybody's fate was sealed in a particular way. But uh, so, and the funny thing is that um, everybody was doing this individually. Like Colonel Imam's sons being in the army, they were trying through their sources. Osama uh, bin Khalid, that is Khalid Khwaja's son, was there to see Mr. Z before my brother got there. 
on his own. He didn't you know, like share any information. So he was there, but uh, you know, he, there was nothing that he was going to do for him, uh, his father. So that was uh, that. And uh, then uh, my mother in England was very worried, worried when she found out that this is now where I am. And I had kept a lot of pets, birds, and I had cats. But one of them died, so one was left. And my mum said to him to release the birds because they're captive and maybe I'm being punished for keeping them captive, right? So he opened the doors of the cage and they wouldn't fly away. Then he closed them again. He said, well, they're not going anywhere. So then somebody told him, leave them open at night and then they'll go away. And that's what they did. And they left the little gates open and in the morning, the birds had all flown away. And I had one cat left. I had two Persian punch face cats. One was like ginger and one long haired and one was white, all white. And she, uh, the cat came up in conversations in, uh, I was talking to them about my cat and how people used to come to be photographed with it, you know, both of them. And they were very, very good. And I used to call her Miss Gray sometimes because she was white and running around on the floor and that she became, become gray. So every week it was uh, time for, for me to give them a bath. And every time I was in my shorts and uh, this blue trough I had for, to fill water in, they'd run away. <laughs> they knew it was time for bath. <laughs> And so we give them a bath, dry their hair, shampoo for cats, dry their you know fur, and then I had perfume for cats, so they were you know looking good. And uh, so the cat you know came up in conversation, and these guys said, "Oh, you're a very wealthy man." I, I, it was June time now, and I suppose there's a chance I could be released. And they said, oh, no, no, you've got lots of money. You've got a cat and you get food for it from abroad. So you must have a lot of money. So the cat got in the way. Hence, negotiations stopped. And uh, <laughs> it's funny. So my cat's picture is also in the book. <laughs> he got in the way. And, uh, you know, and this man picked up on everything. Every little word, if you said it in passing or whatever, and used it against you. It was so difficult that, um, and then, you know, like, uh, then one day they came and moved us, Rustam and I, to uh, another room, blindfolded us into it. And when we got there, we saw Colonel Imam. And he couldn't recognize us. And he said, are you the, the film team? I said, yes. I mean, you know, like just asking in such a way that, we, and that was, a, a lot of time had passed since. And so I said, yes. And we were given, you know, a place in the this what they called VIP beds. Like they were really roll up. Like we were getting a roll up bed, like to uh, sleep on. And he said, other people don't get these, you know. We'll get them because you're VIPs, our guests. And so we took our place in there. And, uh, you know, Colonel, my mom asked me many, many questions. And I said, well, first of all, where's Khalid Khwaja? He said, I don't know. And then I asked him, well, they kidnapped. I said, where is Khalid Khwaja? Oh, he's gone to negotiate your release. I said, oh, that's good. And I could put two and two together and say, well, he is more influential than any of us and he could pull st strings. If they let me go, I can't do anything. So that kind of fitted my logic at the time. And um, as time went on, I said, well, where is he? Because if he's going to do anything, we'll be done by now. Oh, he's uh, eating mangoes with his wife. He said laughingly. And I thought, 
how can he be eating mangoes with his wife when he should be negotiating a release? So I, it didn't make sense. And then this guy, Norman, the horrible terrorist guy, came with a ladder and in our room and he decided to put up a fan. And when I saw that fan being fitted out now, they are planning to keep us here for much longer than I thought. And that kind of told me that, you know, they're trying to make it easier on us, but uh, it's really going to be a long time. And not only that, the fan wasn't in the center of the room, it was more favoring Colonel Imam. So, and I was the furthest away from it, which kind of uh, made me feel, uh, no, you know, I, I wasn't raised in that kind of environment. It was too hot for me. Mosquitoes, they love me, you know. And, and uh, then got bitten twice by some, I think in America they call them dirt daubers, these uh, bees that make a, a kind of a home with uh, clay, mm. you know. And the diving bit me twice and rust them. Got hold of it, you know. The, uh, the we weren't shackled at the time. One of those kind of pieces of metal. And he rubbed on it uh, on my hand, and the pain went away. And that's the trick I learned. If you get bitten by a bee, rub iron on it on the on the bite. So twice that happened to me, and then they had put a scorpion in my bag. So when I was getting some. I saw a scorpion and everybody was looking at me until Rustam said, oh, look. and he got the scorpion off. I mean, if I was bitten, they had no medical uh, care for me. And it, it kind of felt so bad. And then on another occasion, there's a mouse in our room. And I thought, oh my God. Where am I living? You know, this is not what I'm used to. And uh, never had a mouse in our house ever. You know, uh, so why? And and uh, somehow Rustam managed to catch it, and with some tissue, he was holding it with his tail like this. So and we we're about to eat, and he um, threw it out. Uh, well, you know, told them, and they came and. And, took it. and I said, why don't you wash your hands we're about to eat? And he said, well, I was touching it with a tissue. I said, yeah, but still, it make me happy if you wash your hands. He said, no. And he said, I'll tell you one thing else. When I use the toilet, I don't wash my hands either. I said, well, you better not touch my gear again. And I just <laughs> thinking, here I am in the jaws of death. Telling this guy that he can't touch my film equipment again when I don't even know if I'm going to ever touch a camera again. You see? So, so in hindsight, I look at it, what a stupid thing to say <laughs> at that time. But, uh, you know, we can't just get rid of our phobias like, like that. I can't anyway. And um, because they heard me speaking up to him and uh, they came in, with a stick and a piece of wood with a, what they call a V-belt nailed to it, which is the, a truck's fan belt, you know, and um, and it's got Kevlar in it, you know, and he gave me a whoosh, and it was like the entire back was on fire. And he said, you think you're special, don't you? I said, no, I don't think I'm special. I just um, want to be clean and be around clean people. Nothing wrong with that. And they had it in for me. From the very minute, you know, like, because I spoke different. Because I spoke some Urdu with an accent from here, they didn't like me. They said, you're, their words were, you're doing drama. No, that, I, as if I'm acting, you know, like this. I said, no, it's, I'm not. I'm not aware of it. So um, they had it in for me from day one. Then secretly one came to me and says, teach me English, but don't tell anyone. I said, look, Phil, I'll write some sentences for you and just copy them. 
And then another one, Noman came to me. He says, teach me English, but don't tell him more. But fine, <laughs> okay. So I used to write these lines for them, and that's when I learned that he'd been to Guantanamo Bay. And I thought, well, if he's been to Guantanamo, because one of the senses of the, I've been to so, these countries, and he put USA, I said, and I said, no, where, where did you go? He said, I said, Guantanamo Bay. I said, well, that is not in the USA. You see? So um, I was thinking, if he'd been there, now he's come here, and he's doing this kind of work doesn't make sense. You'd think he'd learned his lesson there and he'd go straight. So again, that kind of got me thinking. And there was another, some other things that came to my mind. I thought, well, it doesn't make sense because one day uh, Krishna came to us and said, do you know how to use a gun? I said, no. Uh, Rustam said, yes. And so he said, if I gave you a gun, you have the door open, you want to go. And I said, no, because we were one week, and I'm still thinking we're in Afghanistan, that I don't think we'd make it because A, we don't have papers to be here, thinking that we're in Afghanistan. And B, I don't think we'd uh, you know, we'd walk long time because we didn't have any food or stuff like that. Above all, we were too weak, you know, we wouldn't last. And I said, no, we'll take our chances here. Because I felt I have, I was responsible for Rustam. I had hired him and that I didn't want to be responsible and take a chance when he's got about 10, 11 kids and all that, that uh, he, um, I risked his life. And, uh, Meanwhile, my brother was sending like a uh, van full of food, you know, say, you know, uh, Russian to his family. And he, his wife said, we're happy with where he is, as long as he phones once a year. <laughs> so, um, and they were quite happy with this arrangement, but she was getting more. With, from his absence from my brother, then if he's going out to work, plus the hassle of him, you know, because whenever he got mad or something, he'd get a bottle of coke and he'd smash it in his head. Because, you know, he was just such a highly strong guy. And So on one of uh, Farouk, my brother's uh, trips to England, he was sent a text from his colleague in Pakistan. Uh, where they said three headless corpses have been found. And clearly because he knew Khalid Khwaja has been killed, then the three must be Rustam, myself, and Colonel Imam. And he was thinking, oh my God, how do I break the news to the parents? And because it was then, everything was revolving around them that we mustn't hurt them. You know, this was a major thing. And uh, so he rushed back to Pakistan to see what was going on. And then it was found out that uh, it wasn't us. So he thought, okay, fine. But obviously we were, he was concerned, you know, whoever has lost these, their family, it's very sad. But the brutality in that, by those guys is just unbelievable. And so that was a close one for him. Of course, I had no idea. Then um, while in captivity, they kept wanting Colonel Imam to make uh, statements on video. And um, they kept saying to me, now you've got to come and set the camera up for us. They wanted to use my camera now. So I said, fine, yeah, if, that, uh, if I have to do that. I saw it from the point, that, okay, it will keep me busy for a while. So my mind is on other things. And 
So I, I would set the camera up and they'd sit, I'd be led out of the room while he would give his statement. And uh, back home, my nephew is saying to his dad, is uh, the quality of these tapes, you know, videos seems to be getting better. Maybe uncle is shooting them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, because on their palm cord, it was now going to my big camera. And, um, so, and, and what, one of the problems was that, that they don't want people to be seen, to be reading from a piece of paper. Mm. They want it spontaneous, that it comes out from you, as it were. So, they wrote lots and lots of stuff for Karani Mom to say and to memorize. And he was, read, you know, they gave him a few books that he was reading and they kept asking him, have you learned your lines? And he said, not yet, not yet. And one day they came and started to flog him big time. And I just intervened and said, no, 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 please, I'll help him. I'll help him to learn his lines. And I also slapped him that his glasses broke. So I said to him, I have a pair, I can lend you a spare. And uh, he put them on and his face lit up, oh, I can see properly now. They were in his glasses, were pretty old. And uh, I said, please learn this for me, because I don't want them to hurt you. Because when I first saw him, he had these chevron, not chevron, uh, these kind of lines at the back, and that was all the flogging he'd been. It could have been, you know, see that the old guy they were telling us about? Uh, who was into drugs and was being flogged? It could have been Kendall Ma. You see, because he had these lines uh, of blood on his clothes, and uh, that particular shirt, he said his, sis his daughter had made for him. So it was very sad in the sense that, um, you know, he would get it most of the time. And I, I was trying to protect him as well as much as possible, and he said to me, that I would make a good lieutenant colonel in the army. Because that's, they say, the most enjoyable role you play. And uh, because I said to him, uh, we haven't even thought of a survival plan. And he said, no, we're not going to escape from here. I said, no, it's about us getting on well together and surviving this. Because sometimes we don't hit it off. We're in this room and I'm saying, why is it like this? Why is it like that? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, but it, it wasn't, I mean, like, I wasn't getting through. And uh, I even said at one point, I said, can we have some decorum in here? Because uh, he would take more chapatis in his hands, and then now those are his. And if we left little stuff, you know, because I suppose that's a question of survival, you mm. know, the survival of the fittest. Or in this case, um, so I, you know, like uh, he's senior, but Rustam, who never went to school, used to say, "Oh, look, he's eating like this. Like he he dips into the curry and then any oil he's doing this." So we used to copy that <laughs> just to, you know, escape, as it were. You know, you look at the smallest thing and say, "How can I escape from this place?" and uh, because, you know, the world out there, I'm missing out on. And at night, I could hear aeroplanes. And I used to, there's somebody going from A to B. I wish I was there. But of course, they were not aeroplanes. They were drones. You see? And, um, and then one night, I heard one bomb somewhere. And uh, the next day, they were really mad. All of the killed kids and that. Well, you know, if they behaved, I thought, maybe they wouldn't do it. I don't know. But uh, all my thoughts were gathering towards one final decision as to who I was with. And I was still kind of thinking, where will they stand? And uh, their leader, Sabir Masood, used to come sometimes into our room. But before he came, a chair would be brought in as if he was somebody. And... Um, then a gunman would come with a big gun and he'd be stood there like a statue. And this gun is very heavy and it's just still. And then he'd come and sit and talk to us and he said, if I wanted to, 
I couldn't have had you killed there and then, but I wanted you alive. Okay. So then, uh, but this whole story started way back when we'd um, finished filming in Koita and I went home and Khalid Khwaja went to Waziristan to ask for, for permission to film us. But the reality of the matter is that he, uh, they would have kept him there. But when he mentioned to them, oh, look, I have this filmmaker from England who wants to come and interview you guys. They let him go so that he could take me in too. But they move on their part. So, um, and, and I don't, I don't think, obviously he didn't read the situation because, uh, you know, he was already a marked man before we even got, I even got there. So, and, and, um, and currently, mom said to me, you know, he had no plans to come. His wife says I had a bypass and he had guests, but Khalid Khwaja phoned him and he just said to the guests, look, I'm going to order food from outside and I have to leave. So he just left in the spur of the moment, not knowing that death is calling. You see, because in my book, I say the purpose of death is to save you from dying until your time is up. And death will take you to the place where you are to die. And there's nothing you can do. You can't turn back because it's time. And hence, Khalid Khwaja was supposed to die there, as was going to be mom. And there was no way Khalid Khwaja was going to hear anyone say, let's go back. Because it's, that's how it is. Pure end, that's where you're going to die. You see? So that, that's what happened. I mean, um, we were, uh, now, I was given a tough time because when my favorite fruit being a mango, when they just occasionally bring some mangoes in and they had cut them down so much that most of the flesh they'd get. So as Rustam would say, they're giving us the bones and, uh, but you can't eat them, they say. So I said, fine, oh, okay. And Rustam said, well, we're not eating them if you're not. I said, well, we'll beat you. And, uh, all right, you have a little bit. So they smell it on me. So both ways, you know, they're going to beat us. And I don't want to be beaten anymore. I said, I've had enough of this. So uh, I just kind of talked them into it. I said, look, let's keep the peace. Because that's better for us than to start fighting amongst ourselves. And then they learn. And they all they want to do is hear our voice outside. And they'll go crazy. So it, it went on like that, and then one day um, I was um, summoned to meet the leader in the next room. And what they do is, and it's so silly, so they blindfold me and um, take me uh, outside the door and then turn me around in a 360 as if I've been now disorientated. And they're taking me into the next room because I could, you know, move a few steps. And um, he said, you know, uh, they're looking, all these guys are looking at me. Lots of them, their hoods on, and just I can see their eyes through the gauze of the, the eyes. They're looking at me, and I'm uh, kind of scared. And I'm going to get a real meeting now. And they said, you know, the money's there, and your brother's sitting in front of it like a snake. We want the money. And uh, the guy pulled out his gun and he had, he had a fancy watch and a ring. And he put, pulled out a gun with quite a long barrel and then pulled the uh, hammer back and put it to my head. And uh, I'm scared, I was trembling. Oh, you know, you know, look, you're not even giving me, giving me a chance to talk to anybody to help. So how can I ask anybody to give you any money? And then they said, I want to show you something. So uh, I want to show you what we need to hide. I said, no, no, it's okay. I don't want to. He said, you're going to see this one, whether you like it or not. And they brought out this newspaper with Khalid Khwaja dead on the ground, blood. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, it's in horror. And that's the first time I heard about it. And um, it was kind of difficult for me to take. And then they sent me back into my room. And I had, was in the, starting to eat and I just lost my appetite because, and we were, I we were to fast 
from dawn till dusk as well. And meanwhile, Mr. Z decides to send an envoy to negotiate my release. And they got this guy, interrogated him, beat him up big time. They said, how dare Mr. Z have the cheek to send somebody to us. And they locked him up, actually did threw acid on him too. And uh, about 20 days later, uh, you know, no man comes into our room and says, somebody is going to go into the, your bathroom. He better not hear you because he'll come in here and beat the hell out of you. So he frightens to keep quiet. So I hear the shower running and then somebody saying to him, are, are you finished? He said, yes. So that's it. And then, um, uh, that's the last, you know, I, I thought, okay, this, whoever this person is, clearly didn't break in to us and I don't believe what they're saying. And uh, that was uh, Mr. Z's man. So he had come, got beaten up and sent back as if to embarrass Mr. Z. Not only that, Mr. Z then sent him to go back again to talk to these guys and said, don't play hardball, we need to talk. And while he's doing this, this guy called Swan Punjabi is calling my brother, harassing him, saying, I need money, I need money, money. He said, I'm not allowed to deal with you. We have a court and I have to deal with this. He said, well, no, they're out of the game now, I'm in charge. Unbeknown to this guy, his phone call has been recorded. You see? But he's threatening that I am in charge. Salim Masood is no, not in charge anymore. And Salim Masood would use a couple of names to call my brother as well. And so when this um, call has been recorded, he's sent by somebody to these guys. Like, hey, bro, listen to this. And obviously it enraged Salim Masood that uh, this guy called Punjabi is trying to tell a different story. So the group was actually breaking up. So one night, I mean, they had uh, come to us and said, like, get up, we're leaving. There's a threat of a drone strike here. And so I'm starting gathering my stuff and I said, no, no, we'll come back. How can they know there's a drone strike in advance? It's not possible. So but they, they had given me another diary in a book to writing. So I was carrying on with my diary again. And they said, I'll leave it. I said, okay, so we'll come back soon. So then they took us to another mud hut, which was just atrocious. And um, it had uh, a small, and it had a little raised area, which was supposed to be where you had to go and be. And so you had no privacy. And otherwise, we were told you can go only go to the toilet at midnight. So, and then little things fell from the roof, insects, which I really hated. It's not me. And a scorpion came towards me. It's like lit at night and thankfully, Rustam stamped on it. They all seem to be lying for me, <laughs> you know. And, um, while we're in this new third location now, they invite Usman Punjabi over and say, look, come and have breakfast with us. Because it was still in fasting month. So he said, fine, he goes there and they tell him, you, you, you decided to be in charge. How come? And uh, Sabi Masood shot him, killed him and a number of other people. And then he turned the gun on one of his own assistants and shot him too. Because if the elders ask uh, what happened, oh, they shot my colleague first, well, killed him. So that was an excuse he made. Now, all the blood was on our stuff, so we never got any of our stuff back. You know. Was that all your camera gear as well? No, they'd stored that elsewhere, but you know, like my clothes, my diary, and, and uh, currently moms had some books with you know, so all that kind of stuff just stayed where it was because it was now 
covered in blood and I wouldn't want it anyway. And, uh, but the new place was, I mean, to stay there for me was very really difficult. It was because too many insects falling on my head and who knows falling on our food. And so one day they came in with a cup of tea that somebody's drank from and said, drink from this. I'm a Muslim as well. And I saw on the cup where their lip mark had been greasy on the handle. And I'm thinking, what shall I do now? I don't do that now. <laughs> so I turned the cup around and opposite the handle part, which was clean, and I drank from there, but kind of trying to turn my taste buds off mentally, if you know what I mean. And uh, they brought some lentils in a plate that they'd eaten from, and you could see the marks from where they used the chapati to clean up the plate. And the chapati was not fresh, it was from like a day or two ago. So it was getting worse. And uh, I was just finding it very tough that my environment was getting worse and worse. And then one day, Numan comes up and says, right, we're going to take you to make a phone call to your brother. And I said, okay. So, and my, on the other end, my bro brother was also informed that a uh, phone call will be coming from me. And when we, you know, like, so he sat, in, in, at a friend's house with all, you know, some, some friends, they all put their phones down on the, it was a glass coffee table. And unbeknown to them, they didn't have a signal. Or certainly my brother's phone didn't have a signal. So um, when I phoned him, it was like a public call office. And in the front, they were selling calorie gas. And uh, I had to lie low in the car, be driven there. And uh, so I dialed the number, and that's when I found out. I'm in Pakistan, because I didn't have to dial a code for Pakistan. Pakistan code is 92. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, so I've been in Pakistan all this time. And when I phoned him, no, no answer. When I started phoning my parents' house, no answer, that phone had been cut off. Then I said, well, the only way for me to find out things is call my sister in Bradford. So I called my sister. My niece answered the phone. I said, this is us up here. Uh, she said, who? And she didn't quite get who I was. And then I said, uh, she gave it to her mother and then she said, is it really you? I said, I said, yes. Is it really? I said, yes, I have a white cat. And I just burst into tears. And they slammed the phone down and said, next time we'll kill you. You know, and they drove me away. And now my family's thinking, okay, he'll call any minute, any minute. And of course I didn't. And about a week, 10 days later, they took me out again and threatened me. That if you mess it up this time, it'll be trouble. So, and of course, when they take me for the phone call, they coordinated with my brother somehow, that the phone call will come. And so I said to him, can you get me out of here by tomorrow? And uh, he said, I'll try, but of course, it was a Monday, and I said, can I come out tomorrow? And uh, now that I'd made contact with him, it, I just wanted to be out there right now. And it didn't happen till Thursday, you see. And so uh, what happened was, on a, having survived this ordeal, on a Thursday evening, or what, I think it was a Friday, Wednesday evening, uh, they, Saud Masood and his assistant, Numan, knocked late at night at our door and came in and they said, they're going home tomorrow. So I was relieved, oh my God, that they're going home. And Colonel Imam said, say a little prayer and you've been released. So we're all happy, excited, couldn't sleep. And a short while later, one of them comes into the room and says, to come him up. you need to come and do your statement. I said, we don't need to do any statements. We're going home tomorrow. And he said, if you are getting more, you're not going home tomorrow either. So they asked an imam 
to leave. He had a little smile on his face because he felt he knew that he's going home. And so they take him out of the room. And he had a little pocket Quran. And a short while later, the guy comes back and takes that and doesn't know. That told me that he's not going home. So now I was worried sick about him not going and the fact that our enjoyment or happiness of going was not 100% anymore because he's going to stay behind. And it was very, very difficult for me to leave that place. And well, in the morning they brought some things for me, but the main thing is it kept and that to wipe them clean of any fingerprint of theirs. And uh, they kept the best stuff for themselves, which I thought, what things, even my watch that Sherry gave me. And uh, when um, we are leaving, well, uh, can I backtrack? They took me for another phone call and they bribed me. They said, they said if, you, if you behave, we will give you, buy you uh, a bottle of Mountain Dew and a bottle of, I think it was Fanta, I said, oh great, you know, that was just cold, wonderful. And uh, so I managed to speak to my brother and he uh, said, he'll see what he can do. And they bought me this, these bottles. And when we went back, I got out of the car and this time I wasn't blindfolded. And I looked up at the sky and the moon and the fresh air. I thought, what wonderful things. And of course, I was bundled back in and I shared the drinks with them. Rustam and Kandi Ma. And in the morning, uh, well, and, uh, the, at night, uh, Saud Masood gave us five, I think it was 5,000 rupees each. Me and Rustam, he was 5,000. And, you know, it was like, gone midday and nothing had happened. I thought, well, you know, you want to just get out of that place as soon as possible. And as then finally he started to go, they said, hand over that money. Because on route, they saw a, a, a sheep uh, or a goat tied to, I mean, we were blindfolded, but they saw the goat they wanted to buy for themselves to eat. So they took our money. And, um, you know, they went to see the guy and said, look, we pay for it and we pick it up on our way back. And uh, so, and then they said to me, the people that we are going to hand you over to are boys in a man's game. And tell them that you've come from, Co we've brought you from Kohat, which is not true. Because um, Kohati is where we stayed the night of this politician. And uh, why are they saying this to me? So um, when we, at some point they use a radio and this use the word bypass. And we got to this place, which was actually a dry riverbed. And the car stopped and I, my, I feel my door open. And this guy said, are you Asad Qureshi? And I said, yes. And so he tears off my mindful and see this smiling guy, beard, and everything. His name was Asif. And uh, so it takes me out of the car, goes down from the other end. And they're all like, it's a kind of a standoff. All these gun gunmen on this side and all these gun his gunmen hiding in the car and all this. And uh, so I, I sort of did a stare down with the uh, Noman. I wanted to tell him something which then would have been very bad. Uh, so I thought, um, okay, um, thank you very much, goodbye. And even then I offered to shake his hand, okay. And because I stared at him for quite a while and he was getting nervous that uh, these men might kill him, and he was handed a package. You see, and he's holding this package. Clearly, it was money. And um, 
he was, um, you know, wanted to get out of there. And the money, wherever it came from, I had no idea, was dividing into four pieces, you know, four lumps, for four individuals to count. So nobody knew how much it was, except for my brother. Right? They would count, give him their total, the other total, and he only knew how it was done. And uh, so from there, I jump in this four wheel drive and they take me to this home somewhere and say, we've laid on some food for you to eat. And I said, can't we go home today? They said, no. And then they, they said, look, we want to show you some of our jewelry. And so they brought up all these guns, you know, to show us some serious stuff. And I asked one of them, I said, so who are you? He said, we're Al-Qaeda. And, um, oh, okay. How about this? One day I'm in the hand of Taliban and the next day I'm in the hand of Al-Qaeda. How many people can say that? You see? And so they laid on this wonderful food, fish, drinks, everything. And uh, then they took me out in the town to make another phone call to my brother. And he said, look, I can put you on the plane to England tomorrow. I said, I don't think I'm going to get there in time. So let me get there and then we'll decide. So at night, uh, they all slept indoors because of mosquitoes. But I wanted to be out in the veranda or the forecourt, looked at the plants, and then there was a calendar on the wall. And I kept counting from the day I was taken. I'm not good at numbers, I kept counting, kept counting. And it would technically be 166 days. But because I was taken late in the afternoon, uh, I, I said I should be accurate and say 165 days. And so that's the time I was there. And with the excitement, I couldn't sleep. And I'm looking at the stars and the sky and all this. Of course, being bitten by the mos mosquitoes, which then at that point was secondary. And, uh, you know, just waiting for the morning. And the morning came, we uh, got ready. And uh, this guy was going to come with us. His name was Farman. He was going to accompany us to the army uh, check post for safety. You know, that nobody else can pick us up and take us hostage again. Because that's what happened often. A hostage can be sold from one person to another. Mm. And then the cost keeps going up. Because some people only just, you know, because it costs money to guard and feed somebody. So they say, look, we'll settle for this and move. And so we came to this check post and uh, he left. But before we came to the check post, we got a message on his radio that there's been a drone attack and two people have been killed. And that happened 15 minutes after we had left that place. And I wonder, so maybe we were the targets. I don't know. And I will never know. So um, the next morning, uh, two guys came to collect us, put in their car. You know, and went to check us. And then one of them spoke. I said, I recognize your voice. Uh, we will have heard it. And he said, Well, I came for you, but they beat me up and sent me back. He said, Okay. Were you fed chicken on the last and rice on the last day you left? He said, Yes, I was. And did you have a shower before you left? I said, he said, Yes, I did. So what a brave man, I saw. You know, um, he's come, but I mean, I wish the brave, brave came later when I realized he'd been out there three times now, you see. And there was another chap with him who was a doctor, uh, eye specialist. And he said, look, I, it was about, two, you know, like a few days from Eid, you know, I was sort of Christmas after the fasting month. And he said, I didn't even put any ration in the house and I left without telling my wife she's going to be real mad when I get home. So we're making jokes like that. And, you know, Rustam said he wants to go home first. Whereas my brother said, we all have to come to Mr. Z's compound because we've got to keep away from the press. And he, he didn't want anybody being hounded, especially, you know, said so Rustam might say things that we don't need to say yet. But he insisted that he go home first. And I said, no. So what he did was he got out of the car. 
and ran. So I thought, because we should have had a proper debriefing, you see. And so I thought, well, if that's what he wants to do, good luck to him, he's got 10 plus children, so he wants to do it. And so we went directly to Mr. Z's compound and, uh, you know, that comes all around. And something interesting, as soon as I met my brother and happy to see me, he said, you know, these guys, they won't see the year out. Okay. Uh, so then September 2010, I mean, what he said is they won't see 2011. Well, to our surprise, two weeks later, those guys are dead. And this, give, I can give you the example of when um, James Dean went to see Alec Guinness and said, look, I've got this new car, come out for a ride with me. And Alec Guinness said, look, today's Thursday, and this time next Thursday you'll be dead. Don't drive that car. And in an interview, you know, Alec Guinness was asked, how come you said that? He said, it just came out. He said, I had no idea, I just, I just said it. So similarly, maybe my brother just said, they won't see the year out. And two weeks later, what happened was Sabir Masood and Noman, who was his brother-in-law, because he was married to Sabir Masood's sister. They were caught by Hakim Ullah Masood, the new leader of the Taliban. And they were taking revenge for Khalid Khwaja. And obviously, why didn't they get a share of the money? That they broke their legs with the butt of their rifles. Both of them. And then they shot them in the face so many times that they were beyond recognition. Okay. And then soon after that, Hakim Ullah Masood was killed also. So now this brings me to say that I think I believe there's two connections here. Research and analysis wing raw of India and the CIA. Because Khalid Khwaja would have been a man the CIA wanted to take out. And the reason for that was that he was too powerful at the time he knew Bin Laden well. And uh, the Colonel uh, Imam because he was like the father of the Mujahideen, he was a threat to India because he could have had an army standing on Pakistan's eastern border. He could create one like that. So he had to be eliminated. I just happened to be in the wrong place, the wrong time, with the wrong people. You see? And uh, that's why maybe some people knew they won't make it out. And that's why Mr. Z said he can't help them. Because, uh, you know, he, and, and if you look at the plan, Khalid Khwaja's guide never turns up. And, uh, you know, they make unreasonable demands. For him, they didn't make any demands. They accused him and he's drugged and makes uh, confessions that he is a CIA agent when he was not. Because they made him. And um, so, you know, as in any intelligence uh, you know, so organization, whatever uh, operation they do, once it's done, everybody involved is more or less neutralized. So there's no one left to talk. In this case, I'm the only one left to talk about it because Rustam, well, he's not uh, educated. So he, 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 I'm left to tell the story. You see? Incredible. My God. So you think it might have been a setup all along to, to, to yes, kill the two ISI? Well, ISI gave somebody, oh, I don't know, uh, about 100 million rupees or something to, to find Colonel Imam. That guy just ran off with the money. Because, I mean, I, I don't think ISI was involved. Uh, because, uh, you know, this sort of, this group was created for this operation and Khalid Khwaja had been asking very, very uncomfortable questions from everybody. And he actually predicted 9-11 in the sense that if somebody said, well, how can we, uh, how can somebody come and attack America? They said, well, they can just run their airplanes into your buildings. 
But that doesn't mean to say he, I mean, he just said it off the cuff. He didn't plan it. I mean, he, and, but he knew Osama bin Laden. Uh, Osama bin Laden gave lots of money to Khalid Khwaja to give to Nawaz Sharif, the former prime minister. And maybe that money was used to buy these apartments in London, Park Lane. Also, this theory about the Americans going in to kill Bin Laden. No, it's not really possible. Because you can't fly that far into a country and not be detected. And then there's a film of him uh, watching TV with him. Well, that's a setup. You know, that's been filmed just like they did with that uh, Jessica, whatever, private Je uh, Jessica, whatever her name was in, the, in Iraq. That, Jessica uh, Lynch, wasn't it? Yes, that she'd been re rescued and they made a film to boost the morale of the army. And she, she denied it. She said, this, this, this did not happen to her. Yes, I'm sad. I'm very conscious of um, of going into the wrong area here. And what I mean by that is there's, that there's certain things we're not allowed to talk about. No um, but I just want to say for anybody listening, um, you know, when you're watching the mainstream media, you're watching the mouthpiece of the psychopaths. And if you believe it's true, then it's not, that's just not helpful. It's not helpful, you know. Certain things, I think the vast majority of people these days know what I'm alluding to. Certain things just don't fall down for no reason whatsoever, or certainly not some Mickey Mouse reason that the uh, mainstream gives you. Until we start seeing this and calling it out for what it is, then we're just putting all of our nonsense on the next generation of children. They've got to grow it up in under this slavery. It's all fiction. Yes, things happen, but it's not by the people that you're told. You're you're, you're told, um, as Asad and I said at the beginning, that the the people you're told are the good guys are the bad guys, and the people you're told the bad guys either have nothing to do with it, or 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 they're actually no no problem at all. But getting back to your story, Asad, so what was it like to see your brother? Was that that must have been incredibly emotional. It was, it was, because, um, you know, I was out back in civilization and uh, he was the first family member I saw and I, I felt good. So Mr. Zed's organization laid a meal and I piled my plate and I'm, a, I'm not a big eater at all. Uh, people always wonder, well, you're, you're like a bird, you just pick it and that's it. And um, uh, uh, my brother's friends said, don't eat too much here. You know, they go into my house afterwards and oh, I won't have any space. And so when, then we went to their house and his mother wanted to meet me and say, you know, just to see him. And um, so we did that and then my hair, I had to get rid of my beard and I said, so my brother took me to this uh, barber and he said, your hair is so kind of matted and what's the matter? I said, oh, I was playing a part of a caveman in a play and I wanted to be really in character. And he believed me. <laughs> Good, you have my sense of humor is still there. Because even the whole idea for me to make a joke is to make it sounds so real that people accept, oh, this is a true story. Because you know, what else? I couldn't tell him. Look, I've been held hostage in this place forever. And uh, these, you know, it's not something that he would probably believe or anything like that. And then uh, the next day I had to call a friend of mine to say, look, I need to do a few things. Can you come over and I'm going to sit in the back of your car and lie down so nobody can see me? Because the press were everywhere. They'd even gone to my brother's office and set up a camera. And then I said, What are you doing here? Get out. And, uh, you know, for the, 
On another occasion, they said I was released, and then that they made up the news that I was being, I was at this location, that location, that, and then the next day it all fizzled out. So they they make money out of telling lies. I mean, I, and I'm shot news, and I don't anymore because uh, the editorial from the company is something else. They wanted to say something else, and I said, well, I'm helping you tell a lie, and I won't do that. You see. Yes, let's not mention anything in particular, but you've only got to look out the window, folks, at the moment to see the lies. You know, come on, wake up. Jeez, this is your future. This is your children. And you're giving them to the psychopaths. And the psychopaths own everything. They own all the media stations, as as, as sad, as, you know, will, will, will vouch for me. Um, sorry, don't mean to go into a rant, folks, or a lecture, but so many of you beautiful people out there are starting to see this, this hidden hand that's controlling everything. And even if you don't want to go big picture, go small picture and see the corporations that are making billions, billions off your misery at the moment and pretending that they have uh you know the the way out for you and it's just it's just um smoke and mirrors folks it's smoke and mirrors and it's a beautiful planet when you wake up to it and you free yourself of this fear it's all it is it's it it's it's fear but again back to you asad what was your re the reception like for you when you arrived uh, back in back in England? Wh and what was it? What was well, it like? Uh, the company father, that you worked for. Yes, well, my father said to me, "I've done all my crime." He became silent once he realised where I was. Mum was emotional, and um, so uh, the funny thing is, the next day after a shower, and I had my. Uh, after shower that I use, and everybody hates it in the family. <laughs> I'd love it, and I've used it for years. And my mother says, "Now you're home." <laughs> so, and uh, I'm a meat eater, and she had uh, chicken roasting and all that. And she said, "Please do it for me." I said, "On this occasion, okay." I had a little piece of meat, but I'm not a meat eater at all. But it was fun to see my nieces and. Because my niece got married, and I couldn't, I just couldn't see being here for that. It's funny, you see, that's another girl, and she's, you know, like closest to me, but I, I just couldn't see it, which is was another like a sign that something was about to happen. And uh, you know, I just wasn't strong enough to read the, anything into it, and maybe we don't read anything into this because some things are meant to be. There's nothing we can do to change that. How did you cope with the trauma that you've been through? Was there, I'm guessing um, because of your religion that you're not a drinker, mm -hmm. did, did you have other avenues you found yourself going down? Well, the company I worked for said I should see somebody in Harley Street. I couldn't say, why? Why would I do that? Oh, well, you know, actually they didn't want to be sued for anything later. They were just protecting their interests. So in view of what they said, I went, but I didn't see it doing me any good because, you know, you, you have to be strong from within and sort out these issues. Maybe some people are not and they do see them and I have no problem. But I just felt for my liking, I should just, you know, pray hard and, you know, like we believe in our faith that God doesn't put any hardship on you that you can't cope with. You see? So that in itself is strength. Yes. And if I was meant to die there, fine. I mean, and these things cross my mind all the time because first a million, $10 million, nobody's going to pay that for me. So I said to Rustam, you know, tell my family if you get out that I'm, I was okay. And when Sabin Masu came to visit us, I said, look, I don't think I'm going to get out of here, but be kind to me and my family. But when it's time to kill me, don't behead me because my mum won't be able to go. 
shoot me and I'm sure they'll accept that. But, uh, uh, it would be very difficult for her to go. And she said, fine, okay, we'll do that. And, and I was content in my heart that I, 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 that's okay. On one occasion, I thought, well, okay, they're looking for ten million dollars. They want to, or they'll kill me. Why don't I uh, hang myself? And you know, I was working on this film where I learned how to make a hangman's knot. So I thought I could do this, and you know, I escaped. They haven't got their money. They don't have me. And then I had this kind of thought that many years ago I was making a documentary of an expedition on Mount Everest. And I wasn't properly acclimatized and I just sort of fell asleep in a rock. And these kind of, in my dream, these um, crevasses are inviting me to come over and look and obviously you fall in and it's goodbye. And in my dream, my mother comes and Wakes me up, wake up, wake up. I wake up and then from that moment on it was the question of survival and what they call self-rescue. And that was a very sort of important thing uh, for me that mum saved my life by coming into my dream. And once my sister said to me that I was the strongest man she knew, not my muscles, but my stamina or my... Uh, I don't like to uh, accept defeat. And so I thought, okay, so she says that. And I'm not going to give up for, for them. I'm going to prove to them that I am a strong person and I'll stay. However, in my absence as a captive, Sherry, who was my American wife, couldn't take the not knowing. So... My brother decided to, you know, decided to send her back to the U.S. And she was thinking that either I come home or they kill me so that she can get on with her life. You know, uh, she told me that once I was out and I was all worried because I thought that was, you know, a bit uh, below the belt. And she was telling somebody at the airport in Dubai about this, that uh, the not knowing is worse than knowing one way or the other. And, uh, but I thought to say that and get so that she didn't get out with her life was a bit nasty. But I thought, fine, if you know, that's how she felt. That's how she felt. But we're friends today, you know, and um, I don't hold it against her. And what was it like, Asad, when you when you found out that Colonel Imam had been executed? In fact, I was going back to Pakistan either that day or the day before or the day after, in those three days. Because what happened was that uh, the company I was working for phoned my producer to tell him what had happened. And he told them, oh yeah, well, I said, just gone out there again. Because <laughs> I wanted to finish diffusing human bombs. And so when I went back to them, these kids had really grown up. They were taller. And so it actually showed that this film had been made over, over mm -hmm. uh, you know, time. And um, what I learned about these kids, a lot of them were up to no good and didn't really want to say things that I was asking. And even the army was saying, Look, don't do too much, and uh, you know, because they're still malleable, as it were, and we don't want them to run away and have a relax. Because they saw, they saw the glamour with the Taliban, the guns, the knives, and the four-wheel drives and all that kind of stuff. For a kid, like you know, in that part of the world, that's everything. They want, you know, they like hero worship certain people, and and but they the crudeness, like how my captors used to say, when they kill a soldier, they gut him and they would take take out all his stuff from his stomach and make necklaces with his intestines and this and that. And they enjoyed it. They enjoyed this. We enjoyed it, and. 
because at some point Krishna said, I have to leave this place. The time when he was offering us a gun, shortly after that he said, I have to leave, otherwise they'll kill me. But what made me suspicious was that here's a guy from India uh, living and being in charge of us in Pakistan. And he's got a name like Krishna, but Krishna is a Hindu name. But he tells me he's a Muslim. And it doesn't fit. Why are these guys allowing him to be in charge? You see? And then one day he decides, look, they might kill me, I have to go. And before going, he touched Kurni Mom's feet out of respect and said, I'm sorry I hurt you. Okay, you to go. So there's certain pointers that they say after my race that Kurni Mom was actually, they say, so I don't know was taken to India for interrogation, brought back to Pakistan, and then executed and filmed. I mean, the, the reason why they filmed it is because the powers that be behind all this want proof, right? I mean, just another thing uh, Mr. Z said to me, and he is no, he knows things that, you know, like the way he found out about me within 24 hours. Uh, he said to me, Bin Laden had been dead a long time because he had kidney problems. and you know, if when the Americans killed him right in the show of the body, they did with the Bin Laden, uh, Saddam's sons, didn't they? They shared their beards and said, Here they are, dead. Well, let's just say, um, I'm not going to say a gentleman's name, but a certain bad guy, when events happened in that major city 20 years ago, the the bad guy was actually in the American hospital in Dubai receiving treatment for his kidney problems so he was being look, looked after by the cia at exactly the same time that this uh if we call it an atrocity that he was alleged to have been behind so that story doesn't uh you know that uh that story doesn't make any sense but I don't want to go too much there, Asad, because many of us know the truth behind that event. Um, um, it's it's all it's it's all out there for anyone who's interested. There's been some incredible documentaries made about it, and some real, real truth warriors have have, um, have just exposed everything from the beginning to the end. The the computer systems involved, the the insider trading. Um, the the architects of the event um let's just say how cleverly they use different passports to pass off their uh you know um, uh, and how cleverly they they hide behind um certain personas can we say so that they can't be criticized in public um it's all out there and it's it's not a travesty, although it's tempting to think it is, because you can't live in paradise if you conduct yourself in this way. You can never be, um, you can never be free. And uh, I just suggest to anybody, just come into the light. It's a much better. It's just a much, you know. Love your universe or your God or whatever you want to call it, and 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 find the way. But that to the the you know on on the on the day in question, thousands of people, innocent people, were massac massacred. And um, like, how could you do that? You know, how could you how could you do that? And then look into a TV camera, knowing what you've just done. And blame it on someone else. It it it's ah yes. We need warriors, folks. Truth warriors. <laughs> yes. Asad, let's 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 uh, end it there. Except to say, you were going to tell me the moment when you found out Colonel Imam had had been killed. That must have been awful. Yes, uh, I was devastated because I found him to be a very nice, learned man told me lots of interesting stories. And I said that if I was to be, uh, you know, like marooned on a desert island, 
I would want him to be there <laughs> for his stories. Because he, you know, like he is in the army, he told some interesting stories which passed, helped pass the time. But one of the things he had he, was every day he wanted to know the time. Like in the morning, he, he asked one of the captives, what time is it? And I used to shout, don't tell him, don't tell him. Because if we say 10 o'clock in the morning, I got 12 hours at least before I can get to sleep, if not more. And that's such a long time to wait. I mean, occasionally then they used to give me the odd newspaper and I read it all over again, including classified ads. Then they started giving me a newspaper that probably in a, a Turkish or something, but they thought it was English. And so time, you know, then people say time is money. Time is life, I tell you that. Mm. A lot of people don't think like that, but it is. Yes. Yeah. Sad on that note, I'm just going to say um, I'm so glad that you're still with us. It's been amazing that you've been on the podcast and shared your, your story. Um, it's just utterly fascinating uh, and, and, and horrific at the same time but of course there was light at the end of the tunnel for you and um very pleased about that i wish you the best of luck with your book thank you very much did i also understand there's a, there's a film being made well i have adapted or we have adapted the book to a screenplay and we're in talks with some investors good well then i hope to see you back on our podcast and we can um we can talk about when the film film comes out Inshallah, as you say. Yes. So, can I finish by saying salam aleko? Alaikum salam. Thank you. Thank you. And to everybody at home, I uh, hope you've got as much out of this as I had. If you can like and subscribe, that will be wonderful. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.